All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining us. I'm Georgiana Gillette, Executive Director of the Space Coast Transportation Planning Organization. Our agency has authority to hold a virtual meeting pursuant to Executive Order Number 20-69, issued by the Office of Governor Ron DeSantis on March 20th, 2020, and Executive Order Number 20-193, which extends that order. The TPO may conduct meetings of its governing board and its committees without having a quorum of its members present physically and utilizing communications media technology. Some members of the Technical Advisory Committee are appearing remotely and some members are attending in person. With regard to access to the meeting, the agency is using GoToWebinar. This is a cloud-based platform for video, video and audio conferencing, collaboration and chat across mobile devices, desktop, and telephones. So just to go over a few housekeeping items, the TPO has developed several methods of ensuring public comment for this virtual meeting, a complete listing of the public comment process and how to attend in person or virtually is provided on the Space Coast TPO website. If you are attending virtually, you may raise your hand or enter your request to speak via the GoToWebinar chat question box. You can do this either during public comment or at the time the agenda item is discussed. Once recognized by the chair, your microphone will be unmuted and you will be given three minutes to comment. If you're attending the meeting in person, you may fill out a speaker's card and turn it over to a staff member. At this time, we do not have any members of the public uh, physically present. Verbal and written communications uh, comments will also be accepted after the meeting by email or phone no later than three business days after the virtual meeting to be included in the public record. So at this time, I'll hand it back over to our chair um, uh, to call the meeting to order. Thank you, Georgiana. We'll call uh, the Tuesday, September 8th, 2020 meeting of the Space Coast uh, um, TPO TAC. Um, and the first order is to uh, have the Pledge of Allegiance. Surprise. Guarantee in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So uh, we need to, because we have some uh, participating virtually, uh, we do have to have our uh, attendance uh, done morally by roll call, please. Before we do attendance, real quick, for those online, we do have our go to our housekeeping. So, for the members that are attending, we're going to have a panelist. So, if you have our audience, you can use it and unmute yourself as you wish. Please remain muted so that we don't have any background noise unless you are speaking. You can also utilize the chat box if you are unable to communicate. <laughs> For voting process, if you are online, you can either vote either verbally or via the chat box. If you do not vote, it will be assumed that you are voting in favor and And of course, um, the online in person is national. Okay. Um, for the roll call attendance, I'm going to call off who we have in attendance here. Um, first president of the for our committee and then we'll go to the room. I've got Frank, Monty, Lou Lower, Mark Bryan, and Rob Strong are on the room. And Jared Francis. And then here present in the room, we've got. <laughs> going to have Cliff Graham, Jenny Lamb, Dave Linderman, Scott Morgan, Devin Swanson, Steve Zavos, Zavos, who are we? Harry Jordan, who's missing? We got everybody? We do have one. Oh, Alex Morgan, 
Thank you. All right, thank you very much. We have a forum near full attendance. So that's wonderful. So uh, our first item uh, on non-agendized items is uh, time for public comment. So do we have any previous or current uh, public comment? And that would include anybody online. Not seeing anyone online. So that would then uh, take us to item four, our executive director report. All right. Um, so in your agenda package, you have the draft uh, meeting minutes for the Citizens Advisory Committee meeting that was held on July 6th. That was our first meeting that we were not meeting together as a group. Um, and you also have the uh, governing board meeting minutes of July 9th. Just to kind of recap what happened at those meetings, the CAC adopted all of the action items for the uh, State Road 528 water quality discussion that we had. The CAC voted to support the TAC's motion um, and to construct the 528 widening as soon as possible and address the pollutants through environmental mitigation as funding becomes available. That was the motion verbatim that passed. On the July 9th governing board, they also approved all of the action items that were before them. Uh, for the 528 water quality discussion, uh, it was a very good discussion. Uh, there was a motion uh, with a second to support the TAC's motion, but after a lot of conversation uh, and questions, there was another motion and a second to table that discussion. Um, and so it will be back up uh, for a decision uh, by the governing board this Thursday. Um, several members wanted time to understand the relationship uh, to the 401 bridge replacement. Um, and how the delay of the 528 widening might then po uh, postpone the 401 bridge replacements in the future. So that was a very important discussion because we uh, understand and appreciate how important that bridge replacement is for the port, and, uh, and it is a critical CIS facility as well. Um, I will let you know that there is another option uh, that is uh, going to be coming up on Thursday for discussion. And originally, when we were talking about the 528 uh, replacement, we were talking about potentially going back to PD&E, which is uh, pretty extreme because you lose a lot of time and you lose all of the investment. Another option that has come forward um, really by DOT, and I have to give them credit for this, and that is to potentially lengthen the bridge over the Banana River um, and have the causeway removal done at a later time. So that would be done as a separate project by others. So you would have at least an opportunity to have to lengthen that, open up the flow, and have the causeway removal done later. You would not have to go back through all of the NEPA process. So it is something that will be up for discussion. That is not an option that we had uh, when we talked about this in July. Also, I just wanted to also mention to you, we did receive a letter, uh, this letter, was from the uh, IRL Council and the IRL NEP that was addressed uh, to, to me as well as uh, Mr. Jerry Du, the Secretary of FDOT, and uh, Dr. DeFries kind of recapped all of the conversations that we've had, uh, Dr. Zarillo's flushing study. Um, he discussed the sea level rise issue that we should all be, um, you know, which is very important whenever you do any sort of transportation project. And, and just you know, wanted to let everyone know that they are there to help and assist in any way possible, and that we need to be looking at um, you know, the future uh, of opening up that area uh, for, for water quality in the future. So I did wanna let you know about that, and uh, Dr. DeFries will be in attendance at the Thursday meeting as well. On page two of your agenda package, um, is the director's report, and I just wanted to highlight a few items. Um, the Florida Avenue Complete Street video was highlighted in our uh, newsletter, uh, the en route news newsletter that the TPO sent out previously. And Florida Avenue was just one of our complete streets. Um, uh, Pickery Street in Melbourne is another big one, but we, we did a video on this in collaboration with the city of Cocoa, and we were really happy, uh, we were excited to share what 
a, to, to let folks know what a complete street is and how it can really make a difference for economics, for safety, um, and the community. So we would really like to do something like that on all of our complete streets, and I think it's really a good educational tool. So if you've missed it, that is in your um, in route newsletter, the last one that came out. You also have the MPOAC year-end legislative summary, which is just a summary of all the transportation-related bills that was signed into law by the governor following the 2020 session. So that is there for your information. Um, also wanted to let you know the Transportation System Resilience Peer Exchange, DOT hosted uh, that, the DOT central office on August the 28th through the 31st, and it was for all the MPOs in the state of Florida. And it was really an opportunity to hear from other parts of the country to kind of share their approaches for using the MPO planning process to improve resiliency for transportation. So it was very, uh, very interesting, a lot of good information. Um, of course, DOT has adopted a new resiliency policy um, and their action, uh, their action plan is going to be phase two that they will be working on. And um, there was a lot of discussion, even from DOT, that perhaps, you know, there's, a, there's not enough discussion on the resiliency topic and that it really needs to be elevated on the MPOAC level, on a statewide level, to have all the MPOs in a room talking about it together as we move forward. So um, we've also heard there's a, a lot of discussion in the, uh, in the new transportation legislation that's coming out that there could be some proposals regarding resiliency. Because as you know, our current federal authorization, which is the, the Circus Transportation Program, the FAST Act, that we are currently under expires on September 30th. And um, of course we have a very divided Congress, uh, so we don't know if it's going to get uh, renewed or just an extension at this point, which is probably what will happen. But we don't know what's gonna be in that legislation. Um, you know, will there be a replacement for the fuel tax? So there's a lot of unknowns there. So we're very hopeful uh, that it is um, a very, hardy legislation that it will get us uh, into the future where we need to be. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to mention, we did have our transportation subcommittee meeting. The TPO subcommittee meeting met on September the 2nd, and we discussed some of the changes that are happening uh, regarding the TPO's federal funding and how it's being, being used on our priority projects. And you may be hearing more about that uh, uh, in the future uh, in a meeting to come. But I also wanted to kind of mention that the Revenue Estimating Conference uh, report came out and there is a hit to the current DOT work program and a negative $1.4 billion. And this is due to a decreased consumption and motor fuel tax, which we knew was going to be a, a big hit. And that is certainly I think the punch in the gut that we thought it was going to be. So needless to say, we're not really, um, that's going to be a huge impact to, to our projects that are already in the work program that we have for the state of Florida. So with that, uh, that's it for me. If there's any questions from the group. I had a question on the FGOT um, alternative of lengthening the span. Yes. Replacement. Um, did they indicate that that could be done near the same time frame as the original design or was there going to be a delay? So the, the information that we just received last week um, to update the design phase, in other words, we don't have to go back to pd &E, that's going to require another two and a half million in current year. So the department would need to, one, find that money in current year. Um, there could be increased right-of-way costs, so that would be another little impact that needs to be considered, uh, because a lot of the, um, the the causeway is being used for, uh, you know, the uh, for retention right now. So if there's going to be a future causeway removal, then you're going to have to look for other areas for that retention, which could in require additional right-of-way. And then, of course, there will be the 47 million for the construction costs. However, that's in 2031. So that would be the impact, you know, from a financial standpoint. But the time-wise would not necessarily, from what I can tell, from, from the information that we have currently, 
be a huge impact to the time. Um, but we have asked the DOT folks to confirm what does that do to the 401 bridge replacement? Is it going to push it out a little due to that? And I think that we just don't know those answers quite yet. Hopefully we will know something a little more by Thursday. Um, but we are in close coordination with, with the DOT folks to make sure we have the best information that we can get for the Thursday presentation. So if there's additional right of way required, typically mm -hmm. that would lengthen out. It could, it could, because right now the right of way is in 2024 <coughs> and it's funded. Um, so that's not that far away. And so it, there is a possibility, depending on how much money we're talking about, and I don't know that the department is going to have that answer by Thursday, unfortunately. Good question. All right. um, Georgiana, I think it's important for both the PAC and CAC to get a copy of, of that letter that Dr. Breeze Absolutely. And that you sent out. Um, and, and then also just, you know, uh, in conversation with, with uh, Dwayne when that letter came out, he was directed to, to put that letter together by his governing board, my understanding, and this, and then he had uh, full support uh, of the final draft that did go out from his governing board. His governing board includes uh, all the counties uh, surrounding the, the East River, six or seven counties, both water management districts, DEP, DEP and EPA, and I'm probably missing something, but I think yes. they're all on the side of the letter. So yes. I think that's important to note that Absolutely. we did have a unanimous support from this governing board to send it out. Yeah, very good point. Thank you for that. And has your board had opportunity to address the um, They have not got. Um, Court's position is, is as far as I'm aware, it's still the same about you know for our project is the 401, 401 bridge and then how that interconnects into the bike. But they were they were copied on uh, John, our uh, CEO, Court Director John Murray, and myself were also copied. Okay. Thank you very much. That uh, takes us to item five, which is our consent agenda, as the two items are meeting minutes from July the 6th and uh, resolution supporting the uh, Central Florida MPO Alliance uh, prioritized project list. Is there a uh, motion? I'll make a motion. So the motion for David Swanson. Is there a second here or early? Uh, a second from Jenny Lamb. Is there any discussion on the motion to approve the consent agenda? Seeing none, uh, we want to have a roll call vote for those that are online, or will they have enough time to? What's the? What's we can the, give them a moment to ask if there's any opposition. All right, let's uh, let's have an opportunity for anybody uh, participating uh, remotely to. Uh, at participate in any discussion or, or indicate uh, they don't support the uh, consent agenda. <clears throat> Seeing anyone, all right, then let's uh, call for the question. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, that takes us to our action items. Uh, 6A is uh, resolution 2105. Um, the uh, 21 to 25 tip for forward amendment. All right, uh, this is really a housekeeping item. Um, as you know, each year, a DOT develops the tentative five-year work program that becomes effective on July 1st. The TPO incorporates the tentative work program into the new transportation improvement program, which is also effective on July 1st. Year one of the tip, and the work program should always match. However, when the TIP and the work program uh, become effective, there are often projects that are supposed to get authorized prior to June 30th, uh, but do, did not. Uh, so these projects will automatically just roll forward in the work program, but not in the TIP. 
Hence, there's the need to reconcile the two documents and then bring the new tip up to date. And this is accomplished uh, by what is known as a roll forward tip amendment. Um, and you have uh, that list of projects in your agenda package. It's quite a few projects. And that is the first year of the work program where these projects have rolled forward. Along with the roll forward tip amendment, you have two additional amendments that the DOT has requested. The first one is the Cape Canaveral Spaceport Indian River Bridge ITS project. Um, it's a half a million dollars for design in fiscal year 2021. Um, and as you know, this is the technology to manage the traffic flow in and out of the spaceport. And this is another component of the infra grant that Space Florida received from USDOT. And then the other uh, amendment is a federal highway amendment for new funding under the Federal Lands uh, Transportation Program. And the projects are listed on page 83 and 84 of your agenda package. They are uh, really a routine maintenance pro, uh, projects um, that, uh, that there are federal funding uh, going to out at the uh, Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. One of them is a Hurricane Matthew repair. Um, and the other one uh, is another type of repair over on Dyke Road out on the refuge. So that is your tip amendments that are before you. And we are asking for approval. If there's not any questions. All right. Do you have any questions? Uh, anybody online or, or in the room? Doesn't look like we're seeing anything from online, so uh, we would entertain a motion to uh, recommend approval of the resolution. Move for approval. We have a motion from Cliff. Is there a second? We have a second from Steve. The, um, Discussion online. I give them a little opportunity. Not seeing anyone online, then we'll go ahead and call the question. All in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Uh, that takes us to item 6B, uh, which is the uh, every five year adoption of the long range transportation plan. So I know this has been a long time coming and a major work product. So. Uh, we're appreciative of all that uh, came before this date and look forward to the presentation. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as uh, Mr. Morgan stated, this has been a, a two year process in the making. So thank you for all being here for this historic day only once every five years uh, to all of our committees to adopt the long range transportation plan. So it's very exciting. Um, but it's not the end. Um, there's a lot of work to be done afterwards. And I'll get to that in the presentation. And so just to recap, you know, we're still working forward with the 2060 vision. Um, you guys have seen this slide probably uh, 15 times over the past two years, um, but we want to continue to work on um, working towards the 2060 vision by focusing on the, the three key themes of leveraging what's uniquely brevard by investing in our ports, for preserving what is uniquely brevard by um, having a choice of um, community housing and um, travel choices. And so this is a nice flow chart on the, the long process that we've gone through and kind of how everything feeds into the long range plan. And so we're at the, the end of the road here and we're working into uh, our adoption. And so, as I mentioned in um, previous our previous presentations, the uh, box a big thing that came out of the, the cost feasible plan this time was the increase in box funding because at the time with our given revenue forecast, um, we had uh, it, everything appeared to be funded well, um, given everything that's changed with the pandemic. Um, it may be adjusted in the future, but all things considered, this is uh, what we're moving forward with and this is what the, the, the box fund increases look like in the future. And then, of course, we had all of our capacity projects in the cost feasible plan. And the draft cost feasible plan was available in June for start for public comment. Um, 
We haven't received any comments related to the cost feasible plan or any comments that have affected any of the feasibility of any of the projects or questions on them. And so they're all remain the same as they were presented in previous presentations. Um, and, and then on August 11th, uh, we did post the long range plan document for public comment. So this is more in the past than we've had available for public comment at this stage in the game. Um, really want to get as much of the process out there that we could, um, as much information so that everyone could see all the work that's been done to get to this point. And so if you have not taken a look at that, um, it's, it's still up there. Um, we're asking for adoption today, but we will be working on making um, any final tweaks to the plan document um, as far as mapping goes um, and just content um, within 90 days after adoption. And then, so I mentioned we didn't receive any uh, public comment on the cost feasible plan projects, um, but we did receive some technical comment on the the plan document itself. Um, one of significance was from the Vieira company, um, Mr. Todd. I always say his last name wrong. Pacria. <laughs> Pacria. <laughs> and um, uh, one, and that was in regards to showing the Western connection to Osceola County through the Vieira DRI um, from Pineda Causeway West. Um, so we were, we're removing those from the maps because. Uh, it's really yet to be determined where that exact alignment is going to happen. So um, those maps will be updated and there'll be kind of a more ambiguous um, arrow connection to the west and not only be in the vision map because that corridor didn't even come up as a need uh, this time around on our plan. And then the other one was from FDOT regarding the Indian River Lagoon National Scenic Byway inclusion in the long range plan. And so, uh, even though all the roads um, that are on the byway are, you know, listed in some respects of our long-range plan, they really want to make sure we call it out within the plan because that does open the door for some funding in the future um, as that group works towards uh, trying to get some improvements done. So those are the two main comments um, that we received so far. And we will still be taking comments up to um, Thursday when the board adopts. So there's, there's still time if anybody listening wants to get comments in. And then so uh, even though we're asking for adoption today, our work is, is far from over. Um, just like with a lot of the other plans that TPO has been working on, the bicycle pedestrian master plan and the space bus area transit accessing ADA um, facilities. Uh, with the team, we've, as staff plan, doing a lot of follow up with the local agencies because we have a lot of different plans. As you can see, I just uh, pulled a few icons from some of them here. And as part of that follow up in the coming months, we'll be reaching out to all of you to find out what would be helpful in agency action plans um, that the TPO puts together that you can bring back to your local agencies and it might help um, all of you work towards that 2060 vision, whether it be land use changes or policy changes, um, what would be helpful coming from the TPO. So we'll be reaching out um, to you all uh, in the coming weeks. And then another fun thing that came out of all of this is the, as part of our call for projects, uh, we're gonna kind of have an environmental review meeting with our environmental agencies that we met with in the long range plan development. And with the hopes of that, these agencies might be able to bring an outside point of view to transportation projects and maybe some new partnerships in getting some improvements done that maybe the transportation planning world wouldn't think of or the transportation engineering world. Um, and with those partnerships might become some new funding opportunities to get some non-traditional improvements done. So we look forward to that. And one thing I did not put on here is uh, uh, funding challenges. Um, uh, everyone's aware of, if you haven't heard, some of the the deferments in DOT's work program and everything. And so we're going to face some real transportation funding challenges here in the future, potentially. And so um, the scenarios we gave, the different funding options, the local option gas tax and stuff like that, um, just kind of really need everyone to start brainstorming and think of ways that we can 
to address the transportation funding issue in the future. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions and ask for recommendation of adoption of the model. Okay. Questions for Stephen, either uh, online or in the room. All right, well, we uh, thank you and we thank the consultant team for you know, the system that worked so hard. I know they all met with probably each of us at some point during the process, at least once, probably twice or three times. So uh, we appreciate uh, the, the work that's come into this. And so if there is no are no questions from online or in the room, does it look like online anybody's raising their hand? Okay. Then we'll go ahead and uh, consider a motion to uh, recommend to the board that uh, resolution 2106, the, the long range transportation plan, be adopted. A motion, David, and a second from Devin. And um, anybody online commenting? All right, we'll go ahead and call the question then. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Everyone, a lot of work and uh, hopefully comes with more to recognize all the way to uh, into that uh, major project. So thank you. Next takes us to item 6C, which is a uh, resolution on the Indian River Regard Regional Trail Alignment. All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sarah Tom. I'm the senior transportation planner here at the PTO. And we have been, it's actually been a long time coming. It's um, late last year, we met with Indian River County MTO. And their, um, what they wanted to do was discuss with us the possibility of creating a regional connection between the two planning areas or, or counties. <clears throat> and so we sat down, we looked at maps, we considered both of our showcase trail systems, they are really coming. We've, we've been doing trails for a long time here in Brevard, and the Indian River MPO is really starting to embrace the Sun Trails program throughout DOT. And so it just kind of made a logical sense to sit down and think what, what could be done on a more regional scale. And so what we developed was, which I have to give all credit to Jim Mann at Indian River MPO with the mapping. <laughs> Um, that was all him. <clears throat> and so what we developed was which is this yellow line, and it's the potential to create a regional trail that would connect the Indian Rivers, um, Trans Florida Central Railroad Trail, our Brevard Zoo Trail, and Al Tuttle Trail, the existing St. John's Water Management Trails within both the counties, as well as also create a link into the East Coast Greenway. And so it would create a lot of connectivity and um, open up a lot of opportunities for recreation, transportation, and such. So the benefits for adopting or for de and development of this trail would be that the additional trail alignment to statewide maps. So in order for us to get this trail on the statewide maps, which would open us up to two different funding sources to develop this trail, we need to have a joint resolution between the Space Coast PPO and the Indian River. So in your agenda, there is a joint resolution. It also, so then that would lead to the potential for additional funding sources to pursue this trail development. As I mentioned, regional connectivity, encouraged with economic and tourist, tourism growth in both areas, benefits to the citizens of both counties. You could go for a day trip down the Indian River just by riding your bike or vice versa and also promoting healthy communities along this trail. So there's a lot of benefits. It's obviously an unfunded trail, but this is our first step to developing a trail is we need to get this alignment adopted as a showcase trail for both the Space Coast PPO and the Indian River MPO. So then we can move it into getting it approved by the state and hopefully open us up to some Sun Trail funding for it. So with that, I ask if you could please approve the resolution for adopting the trail. It doesn't have a fancy name yet. So <laughs> just the Indian River County PO and Space Coast PPO Regional Trail Alignment. There I had a question. You yeah. mentioned some of the segments that were 
existing or available, but obviously that's a pretty good distance. Yeah. What kinds of gaps, I'll call them, in right of way or, or ability to, to make connections? I mean, what do you have a rough order of magnitude of percentage that there's gaps? We don't have, um, we don't map out a specific, you know, this is how many miles of gap we have. What we try to do, though, is we, when we look at the alignment, we try to choose places that we're either using um, existing right of ways that would be on like farms or such that people are actually already using. It's just how they're not paid or, or formal. formal. So um, some of the spots, it's going to be as easy as let's come up with a cool name and logo and let's go to the client. Um, some of the other spots, we, we might never have an actual asphalt trail there. It might be having to you know make it a part of the surface. Um, we won't really know till we can get kind of the funds going to dig into what what is the feasibility of it. This is kind of, we're at the very, 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 very beginning of planning. First step. Great question. I wish I had a better answer. Yeah, it's all right. It's, it's, it has to start somewhere. Yeah. So obviously there hasn't been any environmental analysis no, yet. Yeah. Either, so. No, but um, both the St. John's Water Management District as well as also the Sebastian Delta Preserve have expressed interest on both to Austin Greenways and Trails, which is where this could go next after the two MPOs, and to, to us developing this in their area. So. Right. Uh, anyone online or in the room have other questions or a desire to uh, recommend approval of the resolution to the board? Steve? Yeah, um, I see up on the north end, it looks like there's connectivity to the, the populated areas, I'll call it. Um, a little further south, Melbourne, Palm Bay, doesn't look like there's a lot of connectivity. Would there be some type of way to... To, to you know, access from? Yeah. Um, that's, some, you know, going back to what I was just talking to Mr. Morgan about is yeah. we're going to have to dig in and see, but, you know, a lot of the main roads do have bicycle or pedestrian facilities or would be developed when the, the road is widened, such as, you know, Malabar. Um, and also working with St. John's Water Management District, they do already have trailheads out there um, that that could potentially serve as trailheads for this as well. Yeah. Sarah, I have another question. Mm -hmm. Do we know how much of uh, Indian River County has that trail that goes over the interstate, that nice So road. what the length is? Do we know how far it goes west or east from there? So it's it's going to, they have another project that is going to come, it's it's pictured on here. It's going to come past Bellsmere and then shoot up. Um, and that actually is, from my understanding, completely funded. Jim isn't on the line today. I don't think he's going to be for our board. Um, but and then that is supposed to go all the way to US one. From, from my understanding, they're planning that because we basically we try to essentially just fill in gaps between all of our other trails. So true. I just yeah. from more of a personal. <laughs> Question because I get asked all the time, yeah. where does that go? Yeah. Everybody drives underneath and they ask me like, yeah. it's supposed to go where it's supposed to go from the one all the way out to Bellsmere, mm -hmm. and they have this whole idea. Um, there's apparently like an elephant sanctuary out there. <laughs> so <laughs> all right, thanks. Yep. Right, any uh, questions or comments online? Not seeing any okay. Uh, I think we're ready then for a motion to uh, recommend approval of resolution 2107. For approval. A motion from Cliff. Is there a second? A second from Jenny. And uh, anyone online commenting? Look like so we're looks like we're ready for uh, to call the question. So all in favor, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Uh, motion carries. Thank you very much. That takes us to item seven, which is uh, school routes analysis. All right, so I'm going to get us started, but then we do have our consultant. Consultant, there we go. 
Um, we have a DP joining us, Colson, from up in the DC area. So he is attending virtually due to the, the state of the global pandemic. Um, so to give a little bit of a background before DP takes us away for this presentation, it was about two or three years ago, the city of Melbourne and the city of Palm Bay approached the Space Coast TPO with the idea of doing a safe routes to school or school routes analysis type study for their elementary schools. We came back and we said, we'd love to do it, but we can't do all the schools. Um, so we requested that they choose four schools using a tool that was developed by the National Safe Routes to School um, Coalition. And so they basically took back, they prioritized their schools and they presented us four schools from each, from both Palm Bay and Melbourne, to complete a pilot project study. And so we've been working for about the last year to do, um, to complete the study. And we're at the end of it now with all of our results. And so Aditya is going to walk you through the process of the pilot project and um, what we ended up with at the end of the study. So Aditya, I'm going to sit down and yeah. let you present. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Thanks Sarah. for the opportunity. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so I'm hearing a feedback. Uh, so I'm hearing a feedback. Uh, okay, I'm not sure. How to... okay. I'm not sure. How to... Okay, I'll just continue. Um, so thanks again. As Sarah said, this was kind of a pilot study. Uh, that we initiated, we looked at uh, four schools in Melbourne and five schools in the city of Palm Bay. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? Two of the schools, uh, Southwest Middle School and Turner Elementary are co-located. So we are really looking at eight school campuses, uh, four in Melbourne, four in the city of Palm Bay. And the idea was to kind of identify um, a study area around each school and we started by looking at the attendance boundaries and the walk zones that the school board had already identified for each of the schools and by doing a quick GIS analysis we came out with the study areas for each school uh, which then we focused on kind of looking at them doing existing conditions analysis and developing recommendations for each school around those study areas. Next slide please. The study process that we utilized was consistent across all these school schools. We established a technical committee in um, last year, July 2019. We had members from the city of Palm Bay, city of Melbourne, Brevard County, FDOT, the school board. And we started with a kickoff meeting in July. We introduced the project. We kind of established the higher level goals and objectives and then Late summer, early fall of last year, we delve into data collection and analyze the existing conditions data, develop maps. So we tried to understand some of the issues and opportunities just by looking at the data. And then we went out on the field for each school. So we did four school coordination meetings and corresponding field reviews in fall of 2019, and then four additional ones in spring of 2020. And what that meant was, so uh, the first day we would go at each school, meet with school staff um, and, and other stakeholders to present the data, get some early feedback, and the next day we'd go in the field and observe for ourselves some of the issues and opportunities. After that, we developed draft recommendations for each school uh, study area and presented those to the technical committee and the school staff for each school. And then finally, we revised them based on the feedback we received and documented the whole process in what we're calling a final assessment and implementation report. So we have eight different reports for each school. Next slide, please. So going a little bit into detail for, uh, for the coordination meetings, the purpose of these meetings was to verify existing conditions data. Uh, GIS data can only tell us so much and things might have changed on ground. So we wanted to kind of go ahead and verify uh, the stuff that you're mapping get some additional information like how the school circulation is happening, where the buses are coming, where the walkers and bikers are coming in, where is the parent pickup drop-off loop. And the images on the right kind of show our actual work at these meetings where we had these kind of boards with different maps, really trying to understand how the school circulation is happening, what are the issues beyond the school campus in the study area at major intersections or routes. 
and really understand the issues and opportunities as we started thinking about recommendations. As I said, generally the participants, participants included school officials, principal, assistant principal, or school resource officer. We had uh, school board officials, special fund transportation department. We we're joined by the city staff or the county staff, FDOT representatives, if there was a state road within the study area, and then Space Coast TPO and Kittleson staff was also there for all the meetings. Next slide, please. The next day, we went out on the field. We observed the drop-off activity in the AM and the pickup activity in the PM. We had four or five people kind of uh, as a team for this field reviews, and we would break up. So one person would be at the school observing the pickup drop-off loop. One person would be interacting with the crossing guards. Uh, one person would be looking at the kind of the school bus um, circulation. So we were trying to cover as much area as possible because uh, the, the pickup and drop-off uh, activity in the AM and PM were kind of the most busy times that we wanted to observe how things are happening. So we wanted to kind of spread out and cover all our bases. Again, the participants were the school board officials, uh, city and county staff, FTOT representatives, and Space Coast TPO staff and Kilton staff. Next slide, please. So as part of the study, we have developed recommendations for each school, and these two tables kind of summarize these recommendations uh, at, at a higher level. So we have 148 total recommendations, on average about 18 to 20 per school study area. And as you would imagine, safe routes to school projects are kind of heavily focused on sidewalk improvements, kind of filling gaps or widening sidewalks where they're pretty narrow, or if a widening would make sense to kind of create a shared use path as a regional connection. Uh, connecting neighborhoods, a lot of uh, crossing recommendations, whether it's kind of restriping a faded crosswalk or ADA improvements or adding new RFB signs. We also um, had recommendations for the school campus itself, so trying to understand how we could kind of influence uh, the school circulation on property that would help with the overall safety and, and movements of different modes. Uh, we did realize that the state Safe Routes to School program may not be eligible for funding some of these improvements on the school property, but since we were there and we were looking at all these things, we thought we would make a recommendation and maybe the school board or the charter school in, in case of Odyssey would, would uh, implement those. Next slide, please. So as I said, at the end of this, we had eight different uh, reports, one for each school. All of them are posted on the TPO's website. So if you haven't um, looked at it, please go on the website and take a look. If you want to share this with um, your agencies or stakeholders, please do. We're looking for more feedback as we think about future schools across the county. Next slide, please. And apart from the overall report that documents the process, the meeting notes, uh, we also developed a separate kind of uh, a booklet. We, we call it graphical summary reports for each school. And, and what that includes is basically infographics, maps, uh, and tables for recommendations. So it's kind of a more graphical summary um, if you don't want to kind of go into a lot of detail about all the different notes and the processes. This is kind of a quick summary of the existing conditions and the recommendations for each school. These are also now posted on the website. Next slide, please. And finally, apart from these separate reports for each school, we have developed a next steps memo or a next steps report that contains a framework for implementation of all these recommendations, a separate framework for how we can conduct future uh, school route analysis studies, and an appendices that, that uh, includes a list of recommendations. So it's a long table of all 148 recommendations. Uh, we have kind of documented some of the Safe Routes to School programs and policies at, at federal, state, and local levels, and then potential funding sources. Next slide, please. So going a bit into detail about what the Next Steps memo contains. So we have these two maps and, and um, as we started developing recommendations for, for different schools, we started to realize that all these kind of study areas are adjacent to each other. You know, that some of the projects are kind of continuing. So it makes sense to kind of map them all together to see what kind of a network and pattern emerges. And the idea behind this was City of Melbourne or City of Palm Bay or Brevard County could kind of combine some of these projects to make a one project application for grant funding and implementation purposes. So we have these two maps. Uh, the one on the left is for Melbourne, one on the right for Palm Bay, and we kind of 
show all the recommendations uh, for all the schools within those jurisdictions. Again, the colors indicate the different types of recommendations and the, the different numbers is what would correspond to that long table that I described in the appendix. Next slide, please. So looking at the framework for implementation, um, just going through this quickly, we have all the 148 recommendations at the top. After this project is done, Space Coast TPU and Sarah and others at the TPU would continue to coordinate with uh, uh, the school board, the charter schools, FDOT, Brevard County, and, and cities of Melbourne and Palm Bay, basically all the, all the agencies that have implementation authority to implement these projects. And we can broadly categorize the recommendations in four broad buckets. We have the school campus recommendations that are recommendations on school property. And as I said, most likely some sort of school funding would be needed to implement them. But a lot of the other recommendations, say the maintenance projects, you know, kind of restriping crosswalks or maintaining vegetation so it doesn't kind of bleed into the sidewalk space, all of that could actually happen through local and state operating budgets. Then there are projects that are kind of near and long-term infrastructure projects, thinking about new sidewalks or new ADA improvements. Um, these could be, again, implemented through local and state capital improvements programs or state funding programs like the Safe Routes to School program. There might be other grants and nonprofit funding programs that might be out there. And there's, uh, there's some kind of um, information about those in the appendix for the Next Steps memo as well. And then finally, federal funding uh, through Space Coast TPO could uh, fund some of the implementation as well. The, the last category of projects are feasibility studies. Um, these are type of projects that we feel um, kind of pass the smell test, but would need additional vetting in terms of the right of way, the utility and drainage impacts, where we are recommending, say, a trail along the canal or a, a new street connection, stuff like that would need additional study. And again, those feasibility studies could also be funded uh, by the same kind of the funding sources at the bottom. Next slide, please. So looking at uh, a framework for future studies. Um, so as, as Sarah said at the start, this was kind of a pilot study. So we are looking for feedback and, and fine tuning our scope and methodology to think about what we can do differently to improve the process for future studies. And so we are presenting um, our findings of this pilot study to the school board. We already, uh, we're now presented to Tangle Committee. We presented to BPAC uh, a couple of weeks ago. And then we're presenting to uh, the CAC and the governing board soon this week as well. And then the feedback that we receive will basically be used to kind of uh, revise some of our scope or approach, if that makes sense for the future studies. But also we're looking for feedback from jurisdictions that might be interested in conducting these kind of studies within their jurisdiction as well. Next slide, please. So finally, some of the next steps. Um, we have actually finalized the next steps memo. It's, it's on the uh, TPO's website, so you can take a look at that as well. And then we're kind of going through all the different presentations and meetings, as I said, through September and October to get feedback uh, for this pilot study. Next slide. I think uh, this is the last slide. I'll take over for. Oh, yeah. For the next slide. Yep. So, originally, I, oh, thanks, uh, Sarah. Yep. I was thinking we do this as a mentee thanks, question, Sarah. but since we have so many people in person, thanks, I thought we could save the technology. Oh, I'm muted. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so, originally, I thought we would do this as a mentee question, but because we have so many people in person, I think we can skip the technology. Um, so, as mentioned, it's this was a pilot project and so we do want to spend some time and see it was it effective was it worth you know the the federal funds put in it as well as the staff time um it was a it was a great fun project honestly as you know we got to be out in the rain snow and <laughs> snow but we were out on the coldest day of the year um but it we wanted to get the feedback from our municipalities on if this is a program that you would be interested in us continuing and moving into the other municipalities in order to conduct more of these score out analysis. And so we don't have to go on Minty and type it in. Um, you can just you know, speak up or, or type in the chat box. 
if you would be interested or if your municipality would be interested in continuing the score out analysis program. Uh, just a comment, um, you know, from the school board perspective, uh, we think this is a great program. Um, you know, one thing that all the municipalities really want to consider is that the safe routes analysis plan do not allow us to use any of that money in school board property. So it's only really for right of way improvements and projects. Um, it's you know, there could be possibilities down the road where we partner with you, maybe even provide you with right of way. Um, so, you know, we're here to help coordinate on these projects, and then I think this is a good starting point. And um, it's helpful. I don't know how much money it's involved, but, uh, you know, we do have 84 schools in the county. So, I mean, it's a good start, but it's just a drop in the bucket, really. So the, the, the study has the recommendations for on campus things for these nine campuses. And how is the school board going to address these? Well, I mean, we would present them. Um, there, you know, there is sometimes we do projects that were revised the parking lot. We can take those recommendations and incorporate that into the scope of a project that we're already doing. We don't have any specific funding specifically for um, a lot of the recommendations but you know once we can get those recommendations and understand how much they cost and, and what kind of funding potentially could be available whether cities and county want to help us partner with that even if it's uh, for instance like at Ralph Williams Elementary we made an interlocal agreement with the county and their crews actually did the work and we split the cost. So it, that was a great example of how to get more stacking capability for the parent pick up the loop, make the streets safer, and it's a win-win situation for everybody. Um, and everything is kind of a case-by-case -case basis because we don't really have any specific funding for these types of things, but you know, uh, unless we identify it, we never will. So identifying it, as we all know, is kind of the, the first step in the process. Thank you. Um, Mo Hassan with SDOT, he had a comment question. He was wanting to know about the maintenance question. So actually what we're doing is, um, oh, is this Mo? Um, hi Mo, um, what we are in the middle of doing, which was not included in our next steps in the Mo, is after we had our last technical committee meeting, um, the, the FBOT through Chad requested that we create an FBOT kind of maintenance memo. Mm -hmm. And so right now we're working through pulling out all of the FBOT maintenance items out of those recommendations and creating a memo to then pass on to FDOT so then they can formalize and, and get and hopefully get some of those low hanging fruit projects completed. Thank you. Similarly, I presume you thank you. Palm Bay and Melbourne and the county through their roads, if it's refreshing striping or signage or you know. Work goes into normal maintenance budgets. I'm presuming that you're feeding the information those three. Can you say yes? Yeah, yeah. Where we are, we will be presenting um, Palm Bay in two weeks and Melbourne, I think it's three or four. It's like the first or second week in October. Uh, we're still working on setting a date with the school board to present, but they'll be provided all of the information as well as also all those booklets that the DPS showed. We have printed copies for their staff and also their council members. And so they'll be able to have those tangibly on them to be able to dig in and figure out how they would like to tackle them, or whether it's the maintenance or, or if it's a score outs project. I just wanted to give one thank you, Adita, for the, the presentation. Uh, and thank you for involving yeah. school staff, yeah. school for administration. Um, just one very simple comment on uh, 
your participant list, uh, you mentioned a couple times that school board officials were mm. participants. And I'm not sure yeah. officials is the right word because no elected officials got Staff. participated. So you could use Staff. there are basically two Staff. levels there school, actual school administration and personnel, and then there's district wide staff, school district staff or school administration. Just a simple feedback. Um, I think the word officials is kind of this somewhere. Okay. Yeah, no, that's that's uh, that's good feedback. Yeah, um, no, that's that's uh, that's good feedback. Well, we'll change that. Are there any other comments or questions or feedback? Just one question. Um, I assume this is going to go to the governing board. They're going to ask the same question. Would they be interested in having this up for their schools mm -hmm. inside their peers? Yeah, yeah. So they, they will be asked the same question. question. Mm -hmm. And then when that happens, what, what would you do next? So, so we are going to envision the, 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 the one, one we're going to present, present to the cities yeah. and hold any kind of additional meetings that either the cities would request to help them move forward. Right now, um, school safe after school applications are open through December, so they could literally take the recommendations and turn around and submit an application this year. Um, the timing just worked out perfectly and so what i'd like to do is monitor it for a year or two or maybe even three years to see are improvements actually being made was was this push forward um or or was it something that you know it was a great exercise and we learned a lot but you know did actually lead to implementable projects um after we was if we've established that it is a great program then I would imagine whichever cities kind of pop up first as you're requesting them, um, you know, we would probably go through some sort of prioritization process with them, choose various schools. Now, this is also all based off of funding availability and staff availability. So, um, you know, it's also a possibility where if a city doesn't want to wait around, they could literally be able to take the way the report is written and everything's written you could literally take all of the material that we did and do it in-house and, and implement it yourself. Because, and we'd obviously be, you know, glad to provide any kind of support while you do that. Um, but we, we tried to make it where we create a framework where either we could redo it in the future or the cities could redo it. If I may, um, and that's a very good point, Sarah, because just as a reminder, this is the, this is federal money we're talking about. So it would be the cities that would apply, that would fill out the application. We're more than willing to help in any way we can in working with the schools to get the information for that specific application. But it will be a lap project, and it's yeah. the city that's going to have to deliver it. And you know what happens with the federal money. There's strings attached. And so there may be a situation where it would be to the city's benefit to maybe implement the project on their own and not federalize it, it needs to probably be worth it from a financial standpoint. Um, uh, and now, of course, DOT has limitations on the design phase. It has to be over 250000 before you could even apply for it. And I believe that would be the same for Safe Routes to School projects as well. They, they're, um, what they have told me, I'm trying to get back to, you're making an exception on is that safe okay. routes to school projects are an exception. Okay, good. That the LAP policy does not apply to safe routes to school projects. However, the safe routes to school funding does have a lot of stipulations in regards to all of your right of way has to be completely owned and ready to go before you can even apply. They pretty much if you can't check a box that says your right of way, you know, confirming your right of way, your application gets tossed out by you. Um, as well as also drainage, it can't be, it needs to be a safe routes to school project, not a safe routes to school project or a drainage project disguised as a safe routes to school project. So um, basically any kind of drainage cost has to be less than 50% of the overall project cost. And that's because a lot of these sidewalk gaps that are still missing, it, it's due to drainage. So they don't want to see it be a drainage project. 
So we love doing these studies, but at the end of the day, we want to do a study to see things get implemented. Yeah. <laughs> That's the goal. That's what we're after here. So if, if things get implemented, we're looking at you, Jenny, and all the people on right. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, Melbourne yeah, has lots of experience with implementing lab projects. projects. <laughs> then we'd be happy. Yeah. Both, both Melbourne and Paul Bay have done multiple city process for projects before. So I think that they were a really, they were two really good cities to start. And because they are familiar with the application process and the delivery process. So. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, that takes us to uh, item eight. A the report from the Florida Department of Transportation. Good morning. This is Anna Taylor. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, wonderful. My name is Anna. Um, I'm with the Florida Department of Transportation. Um, your construction report is in your packages today. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, on that, and I have a brief update. Um, Jamie Kersey, who was formerly the TPO liaison for Space Coast, um, has accepted a new position at the department um, and will no longer be serving in the liaison group. So we're very excited for her. Um, we wish her the best. Um, and in the interim, uh, I will be filling in. So if there's anything that we can do to assist you guys here at the DOT, please don't hesitate to reach out. And that's my report. Thank you. Any uh, questions? Right. Uh, thank you very much. That takes us to the report from Bicycle Pedestrian and Trail Advisory. All right. So the BPAC met on August 31st and they approved both the LRTP, as which we've already seen that presentation today, as well as also the Vision Zero Action Plan, which will be coming in October. Correct, Kim? <clears throat> they also received the same four outs analysis presentation that was just presented. And then finally, <clears throat> FDOT presented or rather developed with FDEP, a set of trail safety documents as well as trail safety videos and or one trail safety video. So I would like to play this trail safety video at this time.
right. So as I mentioned, it was um, developed by FDOT and FDEP. Or we think it's a really timely video right now with so many people kind of re rediscovering walking and biking through quarantine and, and getting an opportunity to go back outside and, and really kind of reconnect the trails. And so we do want to encourage people to be safe though while we're using the trails and we think it's a great video. And that's all I have to report today. All right, are there any questions uh, for Sarah? On the all right, seeing none, thank you very much. That, that takes us to item 8C, which is our transit report. Here. Good morning, everyone. Terry Jordan, Space Coast Area Transit Planner. Um, providing a transit report. It's typical. Um, This morning, uh, actually, at my last presentation, I spoke a little about the uh, new routes that Space Coast Area Transit is planning on implementing. At this time, I anticipate it will be spring of 2021, just because of the pandemic and now introducing new service uh, during well, the height of the pandemic, which we're expecting to introduce uh, the service in October, as we typically do. However, uh, I was asked that we can that I could provide the maps for the group uh, at that time. So I decided I'll just provide the uh, maps for the TAC as well as, as well as the TAC. So it can be a visual representation of the service that we're implementing. The same information is included in your packet, so you'll have it available to you if you want to share with anyone at your respective uh, workplaces. One of the biggest, uh, two of the biggest areas that we are adding is new service in Titusville. All of these services were derived from our transportation development plan program that we um, complete and update every year. Um, so it's not as though we just sat around and thought of something new, but the two tires, well, the two routes in um, the Titusville area, in Fort St. John area, have been, had numerous requests for service over the years. And uh, so our director, Scott Nelson, took that into account the several areas that we're looking at, like particularly De Leon, which is, it's, we're seeing a revitalization project in the area and a lot of development going on, expected anyway. But we want to make sure that was an area that was served. Fort St. John has been long called a transit barracks there because there's been no service in the area at all. So those are two areas that we focused on and providing the service. So these are actually the overview and for some reason I can't do oh, it. Yes. So this is the uh, total area route, which you see here. Um, a lot of it was developed upon request from our citizens and passengers in the area, as well as working with operators and, and those familiar with the area. Mike's asked them to design the route and uh, lay it out and then build a schedule. So it's um, a one hour loop uh, from start to finish as our typical routes are. We expect that uh, we will see a lot of the ridership along De Leon and then the segment down on South Street is another area that we expect that we will receive a good portion of the ridership. And then it will connect back in at our um, transfer center at, uh, on Hopkins, where we actually have all our other service out that way right now. So we'll see a lot of interconnectivity to new areas that we didn't have previously. Course and John, everything is brand new with the exception of this area right here. Um, once again, we've had a, numerous requests from citizens throughout the area for a service, and so we're hoping that this will be a route that will, once it's implemented, will be a booming route to start with. Uh, right now, they have nothing, all they have is demand response service, and we're looking forward to serving this, uh, this area of residents. The next two routes are our 26, which is existing service. However, right now it's a two hour headway, which means if you miss the bus at any point, two hours before you'll see that bus come back again. So what we have done is now cut it in half. So it would be our frequency, frequency on both sides. This is the uh, bottom part of the service into Melbourne. 
starts in the Melbourne uh, airport and then back up to the side and then oops, so it's on the actual first one. This is the new part of the service. The second segment is from um, O'Galley then out to Cocoa Beach. It's pretty much just runs uh, rear of our avenue all the way back up. And so that's it for the new route. Uh, like I said, it's something that we've been talking about for I think the last two meetings or so, just want to give a visual representation uh, during this meeting. Um, you also have in your packet uh, a report that our director Scott Nelson provided to the TDP uh, for our CCC report. So I just wanted to include that for some information. I'll highlight only a couple of things out of it. Um, we continue to do our best to keep our patrons and our operators as safe as possible. So we implemented a new uh, system with a Gen C fogger, which is a uh, aerosol type fogger that pretty much once every week or so, the uh, maintenance team goes out and fogs the bus. It really is only needed every seven to 10 days. It adheres to the services and it's supposed to keep the services disinfected and um, free of germs for that period. So we have them fog once every week and uh, we continue to use the barriers. We continue to be fear free at least until October 1st. We're considering re-implementing cures at that point. We're boarding from both entrances at this time, front and back. We're going away from the back door only since we installed, installed the barricades for the operators, or barriers, I should say. Um, but this, this product is supposed to be a little bit better than cleaning because you don't have to clean, apply, and then clean again. This is where you, you do your normal cleaning and then you apply the product, and so it's supposed to keep uh, the uh, germs from uh, spreading potentially uh, using this system. Um, one of the other things that we're doing is, uh, we, like I said, we continue to um, encourage our passengers to wear masks. It's not mandatory, but there's been some, some new directive that we're going to strongly encourage our passengers to wear masks while uh, utilizing the vehicles. Of course, all, all operators and staff use masks throughout the day when at work. So that's another area we're trying to, to um, where we're trying to affect the mitigation of the spread of the COVID-19. Um, two things that fiscal series, we had a triennial review and a board kind of internal audit, audit both in the same week. As of right now, we have uh, very minimal findings from FDOT, um, just pretty much small things that we have to uh, adjust, but no real findings throughout that report. We have, I have not seen what has come up with the County internal audit, but I've heard that it went well, so we're doing pretty good there. We continue to, um, advance our project for the shelters. We've had two shelters installed in Beer, one at the health department, one at the uh, government center. Uh, we're going next to one in Rockledge at the, um, I'm sorry, I always forget the name of this, workforce. And then uh, Satellite Beach and uh, Merritt Island will be following those soon afterwards. One of the major projects that I am working right now, and I've mentioned this before, is the Intelligent Transportation Systems Project, which we will have the ability to let our passengers know when the vehicles are arriving, uh, know where our vehicles are located. We actually started the implementation of the software and the installation of the hardware in the vehicle, so we started that project, and we, we actually had a setback because the installers, several of the team from that um, agency were sick, and um, as a result, we didn't come up with the part to do continue installation. So now they've all tested negative. They've come back and started last week. Then. So we're starting back the reinstallation of the hardware on the vehicles. And as of right now, I can actually go on uh, the application and see five vehicles where they're at all times and predict where they'll be within the next couple of minutes. So that's something the passengers will be able to do in the not too distant future as well. And I said that was it for the major areas. Uh, as I mentioned, all this information is in your packet, so if you've got any questions or need any additional information, I'll be glad to provide it. All right, thank you for that really good report. Um, how is the demand response and fixed route ridership? Thanks for that question. Um, so right now, we continue to be at about uh, 70, 75 percent over normal ridership on fixed route. Demand response is still down significantly because the areas like um, the Achievement Center and the Adult Bay type centers 
haven't fully reopened for any that have done any reopening it's just been very minimal so we still have a lower demand response we still provide the service to people that have to go grocery shopping and go to their medical appointments so the demand response i want to say would be still down more than 60 percent as a result of the major client being the um the uh, contract routes where the, the individuals that do use that service are the ones that use it every day to go to those specific locations so um, but fixed routes Coming back slowly, right now we're looking at roughly 5,000 plus per day, right in that range. So let's say we're about 70, 75% of our normal ridership at this time, and it continues to, to bounce up and down. You Any other questions? All right, thank you very thank much. You. That takes us to item D, your public. Uh, Good morning, my name is Abby Hemingway and I'm the Public Involvement Officer for the Space Coast CPO. And I'm just going to briefly uh, report back on our engagement initiatives for April through June of this year. So it's to no one's surprise that this is kind of at the height of the pandemic, but it didn't really slow us down in terms of outreach. We did a lot of digital events and outreach during this time frame. Not only were we promoting our meetings, for our boards and committees, but we were also launching our Vision Zero social media campaign. Uh, we were also promoting the list of project priorities and the TIP, which are, we know are two huge things during this time frame for the TPO. We also held our open house, which I reported on at the last meeting. And just to show you as well, as far as outreach goes, uh, before the pandemic had hit, we had planned, I'm sure that you remember, back in your memory, <laughs> we had planned the um, the St. John's River to Sea Loop Summit, and that kind of got kiboshed because of the pandemic, but we, uh, through Sarah Crom's leadership and working with the Titusville Chamber of Commerce, we had held a series of webinars instead once a week uh, throughout April and May, and they were very well received, lots of different topics involving uh, the trail network. So those are uh, a great way to kind of test the waters of public engagement when it comes to virtual events. And they were well attended. And now we know that that's kind of becoming a norm for us. And so you can see in our social media, we were still very present as well. Um, if anything, we kind of heightened during that time since there was more virtual communication. And then lastly, for our deliverables and news features, um, we had some news coverage during this time with the tip coming out in the open house. And again, you can actually see a big increase in our deliverables and our graphics because we really tried to push a lot of stuff online. So that is my recap for the spring. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Uh, that takes us to item 8E, local government report. So uh, anybody in the room or online want to uh, share anything or your my jurisdiction with the others. Scott, I'll share on a few CIP projects before we get into Of course, we all know I need causeway overpass over the railroad is ongoing. Um, it's moving along smoothly. We put a temporary traffic signal in at Holy Trinity there, so that's temporary. Just want everybody to know that it's not a permanent signal. Um, next one is the St. John's Harris Parkway ITS project, phase two. It's ongoing, it's underway for CCTV cameras, connection, communication, all that. And one I haven't reported on in a long time is the Sykes Creek 520 Signal Trust project. The Signal Trust materials come in and they're putting it together basically over the next three weeks. So it should be swung up probably in the next month or two. I'll be able to report better next month. I just wanted to announce um, at the city of Melbourne, we have a new city engineer now. His name is David Wilkinson, and um, he's been here locally uh, with DRAP, and he has um, been with us since mid July. So if you see that name and you're like, who is that from Melbourne? That, that is our new city engineer. Okay. Oh. Um, 
real quick. Uh, we held court, uh, held our last uh, commission meeting on the 26th of August. Uh, we had the first reading of our, our budget and also um, the report tariff was amended and, and adopted. The next meeting is coming up this month on the 23rd, be the second uh, reading of the budget. There's a commissioning on September 26th of a U.S. Navy ship, the U.S. Delbert B. Black. It's a Harley uh, Burke class destroyer that's going to be at Cruise Terminal 1. Um, I believe the last year, or last, late last year, we had a commissioning of a submarine. Everything went well, so we may be seeing more of these here. The Navy was very pleased how everything went. Um, at our last commission meeting, and you probably saw some of this in the paper, uh, you know, um, our budget has taken a taken a hit from the, the stoppage of cruising. We have had a, a layoff um, and layoff furlough or early retirement of about 115 staff members at the port. We're down to about 140 staff. Um, cruising makes up, at least it did make up about uh, three quarters, a little over three quarters of our of our budget. Um, we're expecting a loss of this fiscal year, which ends the end of September at 17 million, and next year, uh, 37 million. So, a lot of the, the hits are going to come in next year. Um, and our, we're budgeting next year for about 57 million, both for operating capital, which is down from a little over 100 uh, from last year. So, we're very optimistic that cruising will come back in. in in a different form, probably uh, early next year, the first quarter, we're anticipating that. And it's probably going to be shorter cruises, um, lower percentage of people on the vessels. So that's still, still to be determined. But uh, port is still financially, we're still strong. It's, uh, we still have projects going on um, at uh, Disney Cruise Terminal 8 and, and also. Um, Projects at Cruise Terminal 10. So we still have a lot, a lot of work going on there. But we'll be back soon. Great, thank you. Others to want to share? Mark, I think you're online. Anything else? All right, seeing no one, we will adjourn to next month, our meeting in October. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.